Welcome to the Overcomers Overcoming podcast series, where we profile those who are either overcoming or have overcome some life topic. I'm Ron Cooper, founder of The Cooper Culture, along with my wife and business partner. We are The Cooper Culture, who are sponsoring this podcast series. Our purpose is to uh, help others by uh, knowing that they are not alone in whatever life topic they are facing. We also want them to know that there are multiple solutions to any topic that um, they are facing that they feel is uh, maybe uh, too difficult to overcome. But we also want to help people make uh, very informed decisions should uh, a faulty decision uh, be the reason that uh, they are in the whatever life topic or dilemma they are facing. Today we feature uh, Corey Green, who is a, a karate instructor, and you will learn along with us of how he had uh, various life challenges uh, early in in, uh, in his life, but he was able to overcome that. Marty, what are some of the things that uh, you would recommend the listeners uh, pay attention to? I would like for the listeners to listen to Corey as he went through each challenge that he had throughout life and how he determined that he would not let those challenges have a negative impact on his life. Yes, uh, we'll learn together that uh, he was very resolved. Uh, he'll, he'll also tell us of um, having overcome suicidal tendencies. He had a very low self-image and didn't quite know where he would fit in life, but he was able to overcome those uh, kind of uh, factors in his life with mentors and senseis, senseis being martial arts teachers, helped him to determine uh, those factors where he has strengths and um, helped them, uh, or they helped him determine uh, his purpose in life and it all came together for the good. So let's learn together, Marty, with um, uh, learning from uh, Corey Green, just how he overcame a past to become very successful in uh, today's life. Hello, Corey, great to have you with us. Uh, really appreciate your taking the time to share with us. And Corey, I think you have uh, a story of survivability, survival, that uh, our listeners will be uh, captivated to know about and how you can help others uh, overcome and also be a, a, a survivalist. Um, where we're, in, uh, we're looking forward to uh, chatting with you. Oh, very good. It's my honor to be here. I've um, been hiding, I think, and for a long time, not being ready to share my stories because I know what I know is very impactful. And because I know my life has led me into the position I'm at right now, I, I'm literally and figuratively in my, my happy place where I, I have a, a, a been accomplished to get, to get to through all the struggle that I have experienced. And I want to take the, the listener on a journey to where we start in Alaska, where I'm from. And I was born in Alaska and raised there for 22 years. And within the first 11 months, we moved out of Anchorage into a small place called Beluga, Alaska. Beluga population 25. We had to fly in and get our food every two weeks to once a month. Sometimes my parents would travel on an ice bridge. Well, when I was three years old, my vision was really good. I could see 2010, and I just came out of the shower, and I looked out the plate glass windows in the log cabin, and I saw a 10-foot grizzly bear. It was a nine-and-a-half-foot silver tip grizzly bear, and this is exactly how I said it. I said, I pointed, and I said, bear. I went, bear. And my oldest brother said, Dad, there's a bear out there. So my parents went to the gun cabinet, and my mom laid her arms out, and my dad put the rifles in her arms. And then he told my brothers to take the spotlight and put it on the bear from the back bedroom so he would have something to shoot at whenever the bear would charge at him. And when we put the spotlight on the bear's eyes, the bear's eyes were red. 
and it was already angry, and it was in October or November of 1980, and it had not put away enough food. So we were going to be – it's dinner, and there were six of us, my three brothers, my mom, and my dad. So right when my dad walks out the door, the bear gets on his hind legs and sniffs the air, and it can already sense my dad's there. And I watched at three years old as this bear charges my dad at 30 to 35 miles an hour. And my dad starts firing round after round at the bear. And he tells my mom, give me something more powerful. So he grabs the next rifle and he shoots the bear and it hits in the left front limb. And the bear does a dive roll. And I'm watching all this happen in front of my own eyes in the big plate glass windows. And then my dad finally keeps shooting the bear with a different rifle. And he shot it in the heart. And that bear was 1,000 feet away whenever he started, but it was only 20 feet away when he dropped the bear. We called the neighbors. We said, hey, we just killed a, a grizzly bear. And they said, we heard you shooting. We're bringing the pickup truck over. And they chained the bear up to the, um, the truck, and they drug it over, and then we ate that bear. And that's what happened at three years old. Now, I want to tell you that what I do now is I teach karate, and I have been teaching karate for 25 years. And I learned a long time ago that only the strong survive. And whenever I heard those words really young, I knew that that was really what it took to make it through this world. At age four, my grandfather visited me when I was in those woods, and he taught me about God. And I didn't know who God was, but he told me about him. And I remember being six years old, being in the garden and talking to God and just trying to have a relationship with him. Well, time went on. My parents eventually got divorced when I was 11 years old. And I had everything. My dad provided everything for the family. But when they got divorced, we went to having nothing. And when that happened, my life, of course, changed. And I almost became suicidal. And the reason why was at age seven years old, we moved to a small town. And in this small town, I got bullied by 10 bullies for eight straight years. And a couple of them have came forward and asked me to forgive them for the way they treated me. But I told them I already forgave them before they even asked because that's the way it was supposed to be. So when I was bullied in that small town, I left in the third quarter of my eighth grade year as a nerd, as a person that was always talked down to by a lot of people. And so whenever I was almost at that point of being suicidal, I looked up in the sky and said, God, get me out of here. And then three days later, we were whisked away to Anchorage. Anchorage. And I was already in journalism in junior high. And I had pretty good grades. But when I went to my first junior high in Anchorage, it was the largest junior high in all of Alaska. And they made me the managing editor the first day. And that totally changed my confidence at that point. Now, I go to high school. And in high school, I joined something called ROTC. And in ROTC, I didn't know what it was. But this other kid did. His name is Keith. And the instructors asked everyone what the long-term goal was. And he said, I'm going to be battalion commander. And everyone applauded because everyone knew he had what it took because his parents are military as well, and he probably had the best chance out of anyone. Well, I was the new guy, and I said, I'm going to be battalion commander. Everyone laughed at me. And when they laughed at me, I felt this fire build inside me. And, you know, being ridiculed for all those years, being told you're ugly, and being pushed and kicked and all kinds of things that people can't even imagine that happened to me, why, made me stronger. And some people, when they get bullied or they get pushed down, they don't get stronger. They get weaker. But it comes down to a choice, and I chose to try to be stronger. So whenever I worked on myself and learned about short and mid and long-term goals in high school, I was the one that became the battalion commander. Well, I didn't tell you this part yet, but I'm going to tell you now that my ninth grade year, I went over to a different school for one quarter, and I was in our OOTC program. And they had a gold star on the uniform. And I asked one of the cadets, what is this gold star for? And he says, oh, that's because we're the best. And I said, oh, okay. Well, when I went back to East High School, when I was the battalion commander, we won the regional formal inspection. 
And we, the students from that point forward got to wear that gold star. And I was the one in charge of all that. Now, I want to tell you something I've never told anyone before, and I never want to embarrass this person ever because I respect this person immensely. But I have to tell you to you like this. That guy that I beat in high school for a battalion commander named Keith, well, he got fired up too. He went to college and got a degree. He became an officer, and now he's a Fulberg colonel. And he went to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he also uh, worked a little bit at the White House. So my joke is this. If I was, had the same opportunities as Keith, I would be a one-star general. Now listen, these struggles I faced early on in life prepared me for the next set of struggles that I was going to face. But one of the things I didn't expect was that economics was going to be a very big part of this whole process of my growth in my business over the past 25 years. And here's what happened. I started getting serious about learning how to do martial arts at 13 after I got bullied even more. And when I got out of high school, I was tapped to be a protege for a gentleman that owned a school that made $60,000 a month. And I opened his school for him, his sixth school. And the place opened to that, you wouldn't guess where it would be. Yes, in the hometown I was bullied in. So I came back to the hometown. And I went to the schools that I was bullied at, and I told them about the, place, the time I was bullied, and I made sure that they understood that I was there. I went through it, and I became successful because I found a route, and that was for me was the martial arts. Now, whenever I opened that school for that other person, we had different ideologies. We had different perspectives on, on things, and here's the – difference between that person and I. I care about the student. And the person that I worked for really cared about the money. And that's why I left. There was a lot more than that. We're not going to get too in, into it right now. But let me tell you this. When I went to, op to go get this school opened 23 years ago, I went to the bank. And I said, hey, I've got to open a school. And I, I tried to get into a different job, by the way. I did just didn't just go out and open my karate school. In 1998, I went to go get a job as a 911 dispatcher because I could type over, just over 70 words a minute, and I didn't get the job, and there was no other jobs in my hometown. And so when I made the jump from being an employee to being an entrepreneur, I was scared for six months. But let me tell you how it went down. I went to the bank, and I well, what's the name of your business? I told them the name of my business. They said, we never heard of you. And I said, is there any kind of loan I can get? And they said, yes. You can get a signature loan. And I said, well, for how much? And they said, for $1,500. And I said, well, what do I got to do to get that? And then the lady says, you have to go on vacation. And I said, okay, I'm going on vacation. And then the lady handed me my check. <laughs> so I took that, and I invested it into the business. And I basically bought these four things. I bought insurance for the business. I rented out the space from a gym for $718 to rent out for four days a week. I spent uh, a little bit more money on um, the sign for the road and also for an office space downstairs. And I was broke. But here's what happened. Two weeks after being open, I made $3,000. I made double than what I borrowed. I took the risk, and that risk paid off. And when that risk paid off, I felt something I'd never felt before, and that feeling was freedom. I felt free from the binds of chains of having to work for somebody else and just having to get the crumbs. And I, I, what I wanted to do in the beginning was, and what I still do, is I made sure that I would teach people of all types. So anyways, as the school grew, I had some challenges. And I tried to adapt to those challenges, and I expanded for the growth, but I didn't expect there to be an economic downturn. So when I expanded too fast, I lost it all. Now, in that process of loss, losing it all, there's another story about me going to train with my sensei, who's like a real Mr. Miyagi. He's a ninth degree black belt, and he is an amazing person. He's taught for 50 years. And on the way to train with him with my girlfriend one day, 17 avalanches. And this was February of 2000, February, March, around 2000, and I had missed them all. It wasn't my time, but if I was five, ten minutes late, if I was stopped to go to the bathroom, if I would have stopped to get something to drink, if I would have gone a little bit slower, I would have died. 
in those avalanches because some were a mile wide and some were 30 feet deep. So when I made it through all that, I knew that was, again, God's hand on me, helping me get through that tumultuous time. Now, that also spurs another story about how I became a bachelor in Cosmopolitan magazine whenever I was 22. And that right there gave me the confidence to be able to not think I was ugly, not think I was unattractive like I was told by so many different people. And to be in a magazine along with other models, and I'm not even a model. I'm just a guy. That story had to be told another time. So when I went through that process, I purposely shied away from the public because when I came back to my hometown after being in the magazine and being a karate school owner before I had to close it, I couldn't get away, and I didn't – I wanted to get away, but I would go to the store, and people would say, oh, you're that karate guy or that Cosmo guy. And I thought, wow, this is how fame feels. I don't know if I like this. So I always have tried to put my focus on my students and my school. Now, we have to talk about my military experience. So I do join the military, and I become a Black Hawk crew chief in the Army. That's another story. Now, in, within, within that, I also was bullied a little bit in the Army. And I have some Army stories regarding having to fight the hand-to-hand combat drill sergeant and another guy in the barracks not long after. I'll be happy to share this with you as well. But whenever I was there, I had to prove myself. And whenever I was in AIT, um, I had a battle uh, buddy or a guy that we partnered with on a project, which was taking an assembly off of a helicopter. And that person was not able to do it well enough where he got kicked out. And they thought I was the culprit, but I had to prove myself. But that wasn't good enough for the guys in my unit because everyone is really – they're, they're really quick to ridicule you before they really know you. And I'm 23 years old at this time. And I've, I've experienced a lot of different things at this time. Um, but what I did was I decided to take the, the book, the, the manual that they have you memorize uh, for the Sword of the Month board. Well, what I decided to do was I took my four days off, off and, and took that weekend, and I memorized that whole book. I memorized everything in that book. I memorized it to the point where I could tell you the page numbers and what was on each page number. So when I went in front of the board, you better believe I won. I was sort of the month. And then they put me in front of the brigade. And I got all the questions right. But I didn't say drill sergeant after every question. So I got second out of a thousand. Back in high school, I also was one out of a thousand, one of eight picked as well for kid of the year, two years in a row. So these things are important because they show you that when you strive and you push yourself, you don't know where the ceiling is going to end. You don't know what the next door is going to be. You could be three feet away from your goal, and you give up right before that goal, and then you're never going to find out what happens past that door. You're never going to figure that out. So whenever I started this school 18 years ago today, I put out 10,000 flyers, and only one person signed up, and that person didn't really continue. I could have gave up. I had people sabotaging me at this gym I was at. So what I did was I blogged about this, by the way. But I moved my school to a YMCA. I was there four years, two levels below ground, and I made it work. And then we were picked up by CNN News in 2006. Again, another story from another day. Well, we were outgrowing that space a little bit. And over the past 15 years, 17 years, let's say this, I've had to go through three gym closures and one gym having an $8 million renovation. Whenever I moved from the last place I was at for 10 years, the place before that, I only had 10 days' notice. And my second location, oh, yeah, that one already closed. And then I found out from a gym member the gym I was in was closing. I had to find a place to go. This was 2008, the second economic downturn. So I found that place, and we were there 10 years. And people always wondered, why did I have such a small place for so long? And it's because... I didn't want to experience what I did in Alaska. If I grew too fast, I could lose it all again. So here's what happens. Things are going great. My student makes the U.S. karate team in 2016. We start traveling the world. 2017, things are going great. My wife and I are in a paradise island called Curacao. My wife of nearly 17 years, Michelle Young, has been an angel through this whole thing and so graceful even though she almost died. 
and she still hasn't got her stamina back. So what happened was in 2017, we get back from Curacao. She goes to New Mexico, and then she comes back. And um, I, we, we start looking at it, I start looking at her, and we notice something's wrong. She's really fatigued, and we can't figure it out. And she shows me her gums. She pulls up her lip, and she shows me her teeth. And her gums are the same color as her teeth, and her teeth are very white. And I left not knowing what to do. I was crying in my car because I didn't know what to do. I mean, what do you do? You go to the hospital. What do you do? Well, she goes, gets checked out. They find their platelets are really low, like 20,000 platelets. She's supposed to have at least 150 to 350, 450,000 platelets. And if she gets down to 12, they're going to hospitalize her. Well, in four weeks' time, they do that. And they find out she has something called very severe aplastic anemia. My wife said for years that one day she's probably going to get sick with something. And, and she was right. She knew that she was going to get sick with something, and it was something rare, and, and it was. And she had less than 10% chance to live. So she makes it through this. And during this process, I was at the end of working on a textbook that I did finally put out. In that process, I finished the textbook while she was on the walker for 10 months. And when she got off that walker, and all these medical bills are starting to really come in, and even got school, I'm starting, everything's starting to close in. I've got to make a decision. I've got to do something. I can't just go get a job and work a nine-to-five. I've got to have something flexible. Well, my car breaks down. I go buy a car, and I drive all the way to Reno for the national championships. Not one person bought my textbook. <laughs> okay, I drove back. When I drove back, I started driving for a rideshare company. And when I started driving for that rideshare company, some interesting things happened along the way. But let me just tell you about the good things. Um, I was able to pull ourselves out of that situation to the point where, where I was able to pay all the bills, and started making headway. Well, around the summer of 2019, I was like, we got to move because we're already outgrowing this space. I started looking, and I finally find a place in January of 2020, February 10th, 14th, something like that. I signed the lease, and we moved the school into a new location out of the 1,200-square-foot location that had 14-foot ceilings. That was 20 feet deep by 60 feet wide to a place that's 100 feet long and 42 feet wide and 3,500 square feet with 25-foot ceilings, which I'm walking in right now, speaking to you about my life. So we moved it here. And when I moved it here, I, I knew it was another risk I had to take. I had to take the risk because if I didn't take the risk, then I wouldn't be where I'm at now. In fact, if I didn't take the risk, I wouldn't have made it because the other place was so small, people wouldn't feel safe. And the company I was leasing from was out in New York, and they would have charged me every month anyway, even though I wasn't open. So I get to the new place, and the owner tells me this. He goes, don't worry about rent because you just got started. And I was like, thank you so much. So we closed for four months. And then what I did was to keep my students, I did virtual classes with them for three straight months. I made virtual content immediately. I knew this was going to be a long-time thing. Well, if I was going to ask the Small Business Administration for money before the pandemic, they would have gave me some measly, you know, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. But because it was a pandemic, they gave me a lot more than that. But I took that money, and I put it back in my business because that's what you need to do with it. You have to reinvest in yourself. You have to reinvest in your people. You have to build up your tribe. I would not be able to get to this place for people behind me. And those people have to trust you. They have to have the heart you have. If you have a business, that is how you grow it. You have to build it from the ground up with people that you can trust. And that's the same thing with family relationships as well. So what I've had to do is I've had to deliver over 4,000 deliveries of people in my car. And that's around probably 15,000 people. And I've made conversations with them. I've made a lot of different connections that way. You are a lot more connected to each other than you realize, people. You do not realize the power of your connection. Let me just give one example. You ever heard of the power of Kevin Bacon? Well, I picked up a lady, and she knows exactly who she is. And I was talking to her, and she said, well, I just left hanging out with the Bacon brothers. I'm like, Kevin Bacon? She said, there you go. And I was right there. You don't know who you're meeting. That's one of my future books. It's about being nice to everyone you meet because you don't know who you're going to meet. And if everyone treated everyone that way, the world will be a better place with courtesy and respect. And that's the things that I provide to my students. I provide them a life-changing opportunity to help them get from where they were 
to where they're going to be because I lived it. I've done it. I'm doing it, and I'm going to continue to do it, and I'm going to duplicate it, and I'm going to teach you how to do it as well. And so I Corey, drove all the way. Yes. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Corey, you, you, you've covered a lot of territory, and I can easily see our, – our listeners can easily see that you have overcome a lot. Let me take just a little bit deeper dive into some of the early aspects of your life. When yes, uh, three years old, the bear story, that was – was uh, some level of trauma. You uh, pretty much relived that, albeit it's uh, 41 years ago. And uh, you, ex- uh, your parents, uh, as a child, you experienced your parents' divorce. You uh, are uh, were uh, suicidal by your own admission, bullied, and you had low confidence. Uh, there's a whole load of factors right there that um, some people – carry with them well into adulthood, and it adversely affects their um, psyche, their uh, drive to excel, but you overcame all of that. Um, I'm very curious. Some people are bullied, and they remember that for life, but how did you overcome all of this to what appears to be a success mindset? I think what it comes down to is having the right mentors. We hear that a lot in different conversations. We read that in books. I get that. But having different senseis and different instructors over the years and the quality of the people that I've had behind me is what helped me pull me through. My ROTC instructors in high school, uh, even teachers in school, they, they do, do deserve a lot more credit uh, than they get, get sometimes because they're painting with a broad brush. And I think um, by ha- having – it all comes down to purpose. I think what happens when people get bullied is they start reflecting on themselves too much and they start thinking negative things about themselves. And whenever people actually say things out loud about themselves as negative, that actually is so bad for you because it reinforces mentally uh, in your mind because you're actually saying it into your mind at that moment. So I think the key thing you have to do is you have to change your mindset to a more positive mindset. Now, I'm optimistic, and my wife is not as optimistic as I am, but, and I know you guys have those personality traits. never took that test, by the way. Um, but I think what it comes down to is my experiences of what I had to go through, and there's more bear stories, actually, but just the fact I had so much trauma, I had to have a place to put that. And the, the, for me, it was the martial arts, and I'll tell you why that's so good for people and it's so underrated. And the reason why is because people are so focused on sports, baseball, football, soccer, and they want to get the scholarships and go to college. I get all that. However, there's people that I've trained with, like, for example, George Chung. He's in the Hall of Famer, Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. He's also a five-time world champion. One of his business partners is Dr. Oz. I can keep going on if you want. He taught Ninja Turtle. Okay, he was teaching the 49ers football team for 14 years how to use martial arts in their football game. So the point is, is that martial arts has so many applications. And because I was able to take all that frustration and center it and direct it and use it as energy instead of using it as um, – something that would deplete my energy, I I turned it, you flipped the script, and that's what you have to do. And I think that a lot of people don't have those tools to do that. They don't realize that maybe martial arts is a good way, but there's probably other ways that you can do that. But I I don't think that you can get as much satisfaction out of kicking and punching a bag because you can't do that in yoga. I mean, it's great stretches and all, but there's something to be said about getting all that energy out. And I've seen people with special needs that can't talk, I met this guy, his dad, I won't say what he does, but I'll just say this. This guy had, he looked normal. When he played for sports, they, the coaches would treat him badly because they would yell at him. They would expect him to do certain things because he looked normal, but he wasn't normal because he had severe autism. And I taught him how to do a roundhouse kick. Here's what happens. I'm in my small dojo. I have my sign by the, by the window. And that guy, once he learned how to do a roundhouse kick, he hit that bag so hard. He made the metal on the sign ping, and, my, and no one's ever done that before, ever until this day. And whenever um, he did that, my blind student said, what, what is, what's going on? I go, he's hitting the back so hard, he's making the metal ping. Well, when he came the next day, he never kicked that hard again. And a couple of days later, he never kicked that hard again. But that frustration was pent up in him. 
And if you don't have a release for that frustration, where does it go? That's my question. Yeah, and, and your Corey, you are very articulate in uh, several aspects here. And uh, help me, uh, let me know if I'm processing this correctly. What uh, you became, what I'm going to use the term a chain breaker, that is uh, you were bullied, you felt uh, suicidal, uh, low confidence, and uh, th these kind of traits. But you, you through mentors or senseis, uh, developed a relationship. These mentors, along with uh, probably your help, identified martial arts as a talent, or at least you had the affinity for that. They helped you develop that affinity into a very usable talent. I can see, and my, my sense is, tell me if this is correct, all of this work together to help increase your confidence, to uh, have a better self-worth, and that helped turn the corner from uh, some of the earlier, uh, uh, early age challenges. Am I hearing you correctly? That is correct. Also, I want to elaborate on something else that you might not realize is that, yeah, the instructors I had did nurture me and help me along the way, but there's also the fact that I had to figure out how to teach people with special needs through trial and error. And so I had developed, and I have developed, my own methods, and these particular methods um, are duplicatable, and that's something else we can talk about, but it's something that is not um, – someone else can claim it's something that I actually developed, and how I developed those was the kids I would teach actually taught me how to teach them better because the first kid I ever taught ever was a boy that had one arm and one leg, and he had prosthetics, and the teacher at the time said, teach him. And in four months, he earned his yellow belt. So I thought, okay, if this kid can do it, any kid could do it. So the kid inspired me to teach people with special needs more than anything else. And so that is what started me on this path, and I've continued that path because it's an important path. There's a martial arts path. You have the mixed martial arts. You've got the tr traditional martial arts. But the path that I'm going to take is the therapeutic martial arts because no one else has taken that path because I believe there's a lot of therapy with martial arts. I think we believe that it's more – than just kicking and punching. It's 90% mental, 10% physical, and also the fact is that people that even have PTSD, it helps them with that as well because there's trauma that they experience. And I've taught several g gentlemen, FBI or police force or prior military, and guys that had to do, deal with I IEDs, and they're still actively training even though they don't even live but eight hours away. Some of these people are training across the country with me because it, they, it means that much to them because of what I'm doing. And I'm trying to help them overcome their challenges. There's been times I've taught people that are very successful. We're talking millionaires. And I don't get nervous when I teach them. I did in the beginning. They're human like us. And I asked them, I go, why do you like training so much? Why, why does this help you? And they said, because when I train, it helps me take my mind off of life. And it puts it back on myself. So self-improvement is at the core of martial arts, self-defense as well, confidence, building respect, or if you, should, if you don't have that, you have to build that, but self-discipline and overall manners. You have to have good manners. So if you don't have good manners, Great. respect, and self-discipline, you can't be successful in life. Great. Corey, let, um, Marty has a, a question for you. Corey, you mentioned that you learn to replace negative thoughts about yourself uh, and think positive thoughts. I'm going to assume that was at a young age. Can you tell us how at a young age you learned that was the best thing for you? Okay. Um, I, I realized at a young age that I wasn't meant to die anytime soon. <laughs> that sounds bad. And let me explain. Uh, I have to tell you about my second bear story so you understand. I was riding my bicycle. I crashed. Uh, two weeks prior, and I finally got the confidence up to ride my bike again down the hill. It was I was seven years old. I passed by the neighbor's house, and in front of me was a bear and a moose that were fighting. And I hit my brakes in this long dirt trail. You know, you could hear it, and the bears stopped, and they looked at me. And I thought in that moment I was going to die. My brother came down the hill, put me on the top of the bicycle on the front of the handlebars, rolled me up the hill, and we went back down, and we realized the bear and the moose were gone. Well, in that area, we had to walk back and forth to the bus stop, okay? I'm mentioning this because it was scary. I had to go through so much, you know, and 
I realized as time went on, there were so many chances I could have died. And so it, it made me laugh because there were so many things that could have went wrong but didn't. And it did not because God didn't allow it. God has been steering my life the entire time. No joke. I know it. For, it's for real. And I know he's with me all the time. So that's how I know. That's how I place the positive thoughts because God was with me. Because God took away those fears. God took away a lot of that pain. And he replaced it with positive things. Or at least he tries. And I try. But unfortunately, like everyone else this last year, I lost people to COVID too. And it's hard. But you got to move on because that's what they would want us to do. You know, and we have to take care of ourselves mm-hmm. because the people I know that passed away were not slim, healthy people. They were obese. They were morbidly obese. And no one's talking about that. Your health is so important, not just your physical health, your mental health, because the mental controls the physical. The mind controls the brain. The body, mind controls the body. Uh, and, and what, what you just said, Corey, is very, very important. I want to draw our listeners' attention to that. It seems, Corey, that you are gifted. God has gifted you with the ability to – um, I'm going to use maybe two different terms, sense trauma in other people or special needs, whatever the term may be. But it, um, um, have, I, uh, have I heard you correctly that you have that um, special sense that uh, you can just identify it in other people, but then um, you, you know how to work with that? It happened tonight. I was in the office with a kid tonight with his parents asking what was wrong. Because I can sense it. I can tell whenever someone is not comfortable, I know how to make them very comfortable. I know how to get things out of them that other people cannot. I know how to pull. People feel like I'm a counselor, so they talk to me about things. I didn't know I was going to sign up for that job, but I know what I'm doing because I am a person that they can listen to, my students, and can talk to. And there's grown men that need someone to talk to that need mentors, and I am in that position now. They're looking up to me now. And at some point, you have to take that role and lead others the right way. And that's what I think people have to do is help others. If there's a hole someone's in, you don't just pull them up from the hole. You get in the hole with them, and you help them get out of that hole. Very well said, Corey. Um, Yeah, you have uh, just used a little bit different expression of what uh, Marty and I believe are connected relationships. That is, you have the very special ability to be able to sense what people are going through, and through that, you can identify with them and, as you say, get down in the hole with them, down in the trenches, so to speak, but people know that uh, you have genuinely identified with them, and when you have that connected relationship, you're able to share with uh, others. And uh, and quite honestly, it's uh, uh, your life experience, Corey. You have learned how to overcome trauma. You've learned how to overcome bullying. You can relay your personal experiences to others in a way that you genuinely identify with others. That is what I'm hearing from you. Yes, sir. That's just my gift. I, 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 that's my talent. And uh, I know we have lots of talents, and they're, they're, that's what they are. I'm blessed with those talents. And you have to identify those talents, and you have to find out what your purpose is. And I knew what my purpose was early on. But I just need other people to believe in me because I believe in them. And I, that's the one of the things I'm going to make right now. I'm making a T-shirt. It's going to have a message. And the message is this. Believe in yourself. I already do. Because people don't believe in themselves. And that's the problem. Yeah. The confidence is what kids need right now. It used to be the discipline before COVID. Things have changed. Kids need confidence. You're right, and amen to that, Corey. I'm now I can relate back, or I'm thinking back to your story as a uh, childhood. In your childhood, you were suicidal, you were bullied, low confidence, but you've overcome all of that uh, through God's uh, work in your life. And Marty and I are faith-based. Through God's work in your life, you know that you were created in His image for a very specific purpose, and you're going to work out that purpose in other people. People's lives. That's very definitely what I'm sensing in what you're saying. 
That's exactly the message I want you to get because that is what I am. I am a tool for God. I'm a soldier for him. I'm building up people that are less fortunate that can't help themselves and also people that can, but they need someone to lead them the right way. And that's what I try to do through martial arts, but I don't talk about, you know, God in my classes because of religious beliefs and whatnot, but what is not Christian about manners, respect, and self-discipline, you know? So sure. did you catch that? I'm sorry. No, I, I did. And Corey, uh, one of your messages is that allow God to work through you to uh, uh, determine and work your purpose, but then through that, make you make yourself relatable to people and everybody is a special needs person in the context that everybody wants and needs relationships and you are that fulfillment to many people Corey that's what I'm hearing that's what I'm called to do and um, whether I like it or not that's just what it is <laughs> and I know that's what it is and I'm willing to go to work and help change people's lives okay. that's what I'm me- meant to do okay. And I, I know uh, in the short time I've known you, Corey, I know you're changing people's lives. Let me suggest, Corey, um, if there would be an opportunity for a uh, second episode, you are a martial arts expert, uh, karate specifically, but um, you have learned how to help autistic children o- overcome or, or deal with, I'm not sure what the appropriate term is, autism, and I know that I, Marty, and our listeners would like to learn more about that. Um, can we arrange uh, an, another episode to uh, uh, discuss that further? You know, I'd absolutely love to. And let me just say this. You know, there's a book titled When God Winks at You. And whenever something happened in 2006, and I felt like God was smiling at me saying, hey, um, keep it up. You're onto something. And it's the thing. He opens the doors. You don't know are going to be opened. There's dreams that I've never dreamed that have came true. I want people to understand that. You cannot give God. He can do so much for you if you put him first in your life. And that's what I've been trying to do my entire time because before I started teaching my first class, I said, God, this is all for you, like I said before. And I meant it because I knew if I put him first – then I would be able to navigate like that camel going through the eye of a needle. And that's what he, he's done. There's so many things that could have went wrong. There's so many times I could have closed. There's so many times I could have had this or that happen. But it didn't because I put him first. That's great. Corey, you've got a wonderful story. I would, um, I'd like to uh, come back back for another episode to discuss the uh, karate and how you are dealing with special needs students through that. Can we come back for another episode, Corey, and, um, and hear that part of your life? Yes, sir. I, I would love to. Thank you so much. We'll be back. Thank you so much for sharing, Corey. And um, we will uh, have another episode uh, where you can tell us about uh, your karate uh, studio and how you reach students through that method. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me on, Ron and Marty. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Corey recorded this episode on the 18th anniversary of his karate studio. As you learned, uh, he was uh, overcame a lot of the past and uh, overcame a lot of setbacks uh, with his karate studio. And um, he had financial setbacks, but he's in a, a very large studio right now. He has overcome a lot of obstacles um, in his past life. Corey is an inspiration uh, to many of us. One of the next episodes we're going to learn from Corey is how he uses karate to administer to and help special needs children, special needs people, overcome some of the challenges that uh, they encounter, they endure, It's just fascinating what he is able to do with karate. So I want to encourage you to listen to a follow-on episode of how he uses karate to uh, help special needs children. One of the aspects uh, that Corey has uh, engaged in has been very successful, and it's uh, true all throughout life, irrespective of uh, what challenges any of us may be going through is the value of relationships, connected relationships very specifically. 
As we have connected relationships, those with whom we can put our total trust, those with whom we can communicate very well and we feel totally accepted, that's the kind of relationship that uh, helped Corey, has helped me, Marty, many of us through various life topics. Marty and I have developed a relationship course that uh, we want to make available to you. It is, uh, for the moment, uh, tailored to dating and uh, courting, courtship leading to marriage, but we're also producing a course that, uh, on uh, relationships that uh, are specific to the workplace. And we want to encourage you to engage in that and uh, let us know your thoughts. Engage in um, uh, communication with us. Let us know thoughts that you have in uh, challenges you have overcome. Um, everybody is unique and um, we want to uh, we want to know the challenges you've overcome, how you've overcome, uh, what it is you've done in life. Let's share with each other and uh, let's just acknowledge that uh, each one of us has various life challenges that uh, we are either in the process of overcoming and we may need some help. We just like to uh, have the trust that uh, we can work things out with other people. But let's also share experiences we have that uh, your experience while being unique uh, certainly will likely have application to others. So let's, uh, let's do uh, engage with each other. Call us at 410-586-1875 or send an email to ron at thecooperculture.com or marty at thecooperculture.com. But let's engage, let's share some ideas, and let's start a community where we are in, uh, in, uh, passionately want to reach out to others and help them through whatever life challenge they're uh, going through to uh, help them have a total life of fulfillment that uh, Marty and I have with each other with uh, at this uh, the point of this recording, 52 years of marriage and uh, we're just loving life. So let's help others do just the same. We look forward to engaging with you.